Gallen, I'm a professor at Moscow State University, and uh, uh, we have now Center of Modern Marxist Studies in the Department of Philosophy, and Lomonos of Moscow State University is the main university in our country, so we are very proud to have such center. And this panel is organized because of the 30th anniversary, I can say anniversary, uh, of the article and book uh, which was written by a uh, person whose name I prefer to forget, but everybody <laughs> remember. Uh, it's uh, like, uh, okay, no parallels. Uh, so, 30 years ago, the last man, uh, and uh, the end of the history, the end of the history of the last man, article and uh, then book was published, and the uh, establishment was uh, sure that it will be on the neoliberal agenda and the peaceful borrowing of the existence of everybody. But these 30 years uh, were full of contradictions and full of, full of different conflicts, even wars. And now we are talking about end of the end of the history. So the epoch of Fukuyama is definitely finished. We have the end of neoliberal globalization, but the challenge is what will be tomorrow. And uh, I will keep another two minutes because people are coming, and then uh, I will ask uh, all our wonderful speakers to participate in our debates. Uh, so uh, the idea of these debates uh, is uh, a little bit simple. Is it uh, possible or impossible to have left alternative to the trend, uh, which is from my point of view, a liberal conservative system or conservative liberalism? Very strange mixture of liberal economic and social policy with very conservative ideology and maybe even authoritarian or semi-fascist political system. I think this is a real threat and not only in Russia, unfortunately. And the alternative to this threat, the reasons why it was the idea of the end of the history, why this idea is failed, and uh, this is the agenda. And uh, now I think uh, there is course who knows much better all speakers than me, but we are old friends also with everybody. But I can say just simply David Harvey, uh, who you know, uh, he is from the University of uh, New York, or New York City University, how is uh, better to say? The city University. City University. I'm confused all time. State University, City University, and University of New York. Michael Hudson and uh, David, uh, Michael Hudson is the author of many books uh, and last forum. It was a great presentation of his last book about, uh, I think, garbage economy. I don't know how to say it better, but junk economy. Yeah, and David Coates is also of many books about Russia and uh, we are very old friends, and he is professor in the University of Mark, uh, Massachusetts in Amherst. Uh, I don't know, according to the order, who is the first speaker? David Carr. So, David, uh, you have your 20 minutes, and uh, we are very happy that you are here. Thank you for coming, for everybody. Uh, 
people don't appreciate how to understand these data and these statistics, and if only they looked at uh, the rate of uh, proportionate uh, increase in income, uh, then you would recognize that quantitative easing benefited uh, more than 10%. And when you look at it, you say 3,000 pounds over six years, that's about a pound a week. Uh, that is a, hardly anything in terms of uh, increase in uh, well-being and political and economic power uh, of uh, 10, more than 10 percent. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the top 10 percent was getting, uh, you know, well over 120 pounds over a week. Uh, you know, you add that up over six years, and that's you know possible to buy at least two U.S. senators with that. <laughs> so it, it does increase the the, the, the power incredibly. Uh, yeah, but, and this then kind of says, look, there's an interesting question here. What's the relationship between the rate of change and the mass? Uh, uh, in other words, I'll give you a choice. Would you rather have a 10% increase on $10 than a 5% increase on a million dollars, which would you choose? Okay. And here's the point, that the mass is very significant. And a lot of analysis, and this was the thrust of the book, report, should be conducted in terms of rates of change rather than in terms of the mass. But the mass, it turns out, is incredibly important. And I think that one of the things that happens is that in economics, Constantly, there's an analysis of rates of change and rates of change. Very little attention is paid to the mass. And actually, this is true of Marxist economics as well. I mean, there's a lot of discussion of the rate of profit, and the rate of profit will fall. But there's very little discussion about, about rising mass, and what the rising mass might mean. And actually, if you go back to Marx's chapter on the falling rate of profit, which is one single chapter in the original notes, you see that Marx is as much concerned with the rising mass as he is with the falling rate. Yet we don't have really studies on the left which look very close to the mass. For instance, this is what he, what he says in this chapter, and I can never go very far in a lecture without quoting directly from Marx. I'm sorry about that. Marx argues that the, despite the enormous decline in the general rate of profit, the number of workers employed by capital, i.e. the absolute mass of labor set in motion by it, hence the absolute mass of the surplus labor absorbed, appropriated by it, hence the mass of the surplus value produces, hence the absolute magnitude of mass of the profit produced by it, can therefore grow, and progressively so, despite the progressive fall in the rate of profit. This not only can, but must be the case. Now, Engels, in his editing, called this a counteracting uh, factor. But Marx presents it as a joint product of the Hamlet for surplus value. And you can go back to volume one of Capital, the chapter on rate and mass, in which Marx talks about what's more important for the capitalists, increasing the mass or increasing their rate. And the answer here was, well, you can increase the rate, but you can also increase the mass by simply employing more laborers. Uh, and then Marx poses the, pro the problem. How then, Marx? Should we present this double-edged law, this is my emphasis, of a decline in the rate of profit coupled with a simultaneous increase in the absolute mass of profit arising from the same causes? And then again, the same reasons that produce an absolute decline in surplus value and hence profit bring about a growth in the mass of the surplus labor, surplus value, and therefore profit produced and appropriated by the social capital. And then Marx says, how can this be explained? What is it dependent on and what conditions are involved in this apparent contradiction? Now this is a, a contradiction that we ought to pay very clear attention to. Because if you don't pay attention to the mass and the rising mass, then you miss out on something that's terribly important. For instance, in this conference, there's a lot of emphasis on the climate change. The interesting kind of question is the rate of emissions and all that, and all the discussion of that. But there's a, a very telling graph put out on carbon concentrations over the last 800,000 years. Never have those carbon concentrations over that period exceeded 300 parts per million. Never. Except in the last 10 years when they've gone up to 407. This is an increase in the mass of carbon uh, of greenhouse gases. And that increase in the mass is, is of course what is melting a Greenland ice sheet and Antarctica and destroying the Himalayas and the snows and all the rest of it. So paying attention to the mass. Now, 
Marx is talking here about the increasing mass, and the increasing mass plays a very important political role. For instance, earlier this year, people became very nervous about the fact that the rate of growth in China was slowing, and it was slowing significantly. And then one would say, well, why aren't the Chinese so worried about this, as they should be? And the answer had to do with the fact that actually they had such a mass now that they could actually absorb a lower, lower rate of growth. So that last year they created, in terms of uh, consumer demand, something like $1.2 trillion of new consumer demand, which is twice as much as they had generated 15 years before with a 12% rate of growth. And now they've got a 6% rate of growth. So a 6% rate of growth was actually generating enough mass to absorb something like 10 million jobs in a year. So, so the, the increasing mass is, where, is where, where it is at. But when you go to the literature and you say, well, who's talking about the increasing mass and the significance of the increasing mass? You don't really find it there. And this comes back to the following dilemma, which I've often argued about, which is the compound rate of growth, which is the increasing mass of goods and commodities in circulation. Uh, when I was uh, uh, 15 in, in, in 19, 1950, the total value of goods and services measured in 1990 dollars, according to Brad Long, was just over four trillion dollars. By the time you get to my retirement age of 2000, uh, it was $40 trillion. It's now closer to $80 trillion. It has been doubling every 25 years. Now, finding investment opportunities for $40 trillion is very different from finding investment opportunities for $4 trillion. And that's very different from finding investment opportunities for $80 trillion or down the line, $160 trillion. In other words, in other words, we've reached a point where the mass has become so huge and so overwhelming. And when, then you start to say, well, actually, what about the mass of capital and where it's located and how it is being moved and, and, and all the rest of it? We now have conglomerations of capital which are so huge that it's impossible to understand exactly what they might contain and what they might be about. And then you find a situation of the following. The Koch brothers have the political clout they have, not because of the high rate of return on their capital, but because of the mass they control. And it's the control of the mass which renders political power. It's the control of the mass which is what the autarky is about. They don't care about the rate. They just, just give them 2% on $50 trillion and they're all right. They're doing well. They've got an enormous amount of extra power. And what we start to see is the significance of this in both directions. For instance, if you have access to the mass, you can do things that you, that, that you can't do if you don't have access to it. George Soros, in 1992, broke the British pound, and, and before he broke the British pound, he borrowed a billion pounds. Okay, now, I tried to borrow a billion pounds. I know what <laughs> he borrowed a billion pounds, okay, and he converted the pounds into Deutsche Marks. He put pressure on the pound, the pound gets devalued. Just before it's devalued, he borrowed another 14 billion pounds. So he had about 15 billion, which he converted into Deutschmarks. The pound gets devalued. He then converts that back into the pounds. He pays off everybody that, that he's borrowed money from. And he himself walks away, and nobody knows quite for how much, but it's nothing short of a billion pounds. And it possibly was in the order of seven or eight billion pounds, who knows. But the point is that access to the mass gave him access to more mass. And, and there's a wonderful cartoon that came out in the, the, the Financial Times just recently of these two old characters sort of sitting there around the fire reading the newspaper and one person says, and the, the headline of the newspaper is, you know, Boris Johnson is proposing big tax cuts for the rich. And, and this person kind of said, um, you know, I think I'm, you know, I wish I was rich because then I'd become richer. <laughs> But this is, the, this is the source of the inequality. The inequality is not about rates. It's not about, it, it really is not, it's about the control over the mass. And the same is true of many, almost all the other problems that we see. And yet, we've not investigated the mass. Now I can go through Marx and show you that Marx was actually very alert with the mass. And as it has in that chapter on the corner rate of profit, he kind of says, you know, the increase in the mass puts pressure in all sorts of ways, he says. For instance, the increase of the mass means that you've got to increase your market and you've got to increase the flow of raw materials. Increase extractivism, increase market penetration. 
And he then kind of says, well, how do you do this? And then, and then he said, well, actually, in the British case, they've got India. Well, okay, they destroyed Indian industry, and they then could market all of their cottons to industry. So, if, you know, that's, that's the way you dealt with that, that problem. But then India has to send something back. And so it sends back, you know, raw cotton and you and all those kinds of things. Uh, but that wasn't enough, so in the end, the British you know, persuaded the Indians to grow opium, and then it was a wonderful thing, you know. Send the British Navy to, to open China to the drug trade. Yeah. Can you imagine doing that? I mean, that's what the British <coughs> did. Opened it to the drug tra trade, sold the opium to the Chinese, got the Chinese silver, and the Chinese silver went to India and then went back to London. <coughs> and of course, the imperial, which is what imperial practices were all about. So, but in this case, you then kind of say, okay, well, the Indian trade at, at, at worked. What, what about, you know, now? Where are the Indias now where you can expand into when you've got the mass? You've now got China, the mass. And, and when you start doing studies of the mass, you find all sorts of incredible data. I mean, I, if I had a slide, I'd show it to you right now. Chinese cement consumption. The Chinese in two years consume 45% more cement than the United States consumed in 100 years. If you just look at the two graphs and you kind of say, what are the environmental consequences of spreading cement around like that? By the way, making cement is environmentally you know, very unfriendly and it creates a lot of greenhouse gases and you can actually see the increase in greenhouse gases in China has a lot to do with the increasing you know, production and consumption of cement. But what, what, what does this increase in mass mean? And, and how, how are we going to deal with it? For instance, the climate change thing says that politics right now about the environment has to be not simply about controlling the rate of increase of, of greenhouse gases. It has to be about getting those greenhouse gases that already exist out of the atmosphere and back into the earth somehow. How do you do that? Well, that, how it was done historically was plants and animals did it. <coughs> So actually there's a big role for global agriculture, which is to actually grow the kind of plants that take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and put it on the ground. Now, right now you're paying a lot of farmers not to produce. Well, now you can actually pay them to produce carbon gas absorption crops. But that's going to take international agreement. That's going to take mass politics. It's going to take all kinds of things of that kind, which the world is not really prepared for. And we are not prepared for it. And we are not even on the left thinking about problems of the mass. And what to do about the problems of the mass. And I think that the assumption is, OK, well, we can keep on going the way we are. Maybe we can make it a bit more social democratic and a bit more all this kind of thing, which is, which is, which is great. And, you know, I can support all of that. But there are inflection points in history. And the inflection points in history it seems to me, are those in which there is no way you can proceed further without radical reconfiguration of the whole mode of production. And that leads me to say quite simply why it is that I'm an anti-capitalist. Not anti-capitalist because it's immoral, which it is, but I don't care about that. Not, I'm not anti-capitalist for, for, you know, sort of, uh, kind of normal left reasons. I'm anti-capitalist because Something different has to be created, which is absolutely not going to catch us in this mass uh, absorption problem. Mass absorption in the realm of consumption, mass, of, uh, mass extraction in the terms of extractivism. And you kind of look at the total copper which was pulled out of the earth in the last two or three years. It's gone up by 10 or 15 percent. You look at the, the mountains of waste. There was no plastics around in, in, in 1950. Now there's tons of it, tons of it, tons of it, and the, the amount of plastic waste is huge. It's reached a, a point of, 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 of impossible absorption of plastic waste. So you look at all of these problems, and those, it seems to me, are all about the mass, which is at the center of what I want to talk about. Now there are many other things in Marxist theory that are actually derived from an analysis of the mass. He said far, far more about it than uh, people have generally acknowledged, and I failed to acknowledge it as much as I should have done in, in, in my writings about it too, about to change that. But the point here is that think about this relationship between rate and mass, and think about all of the literature you read, which is very much prescribed in terms of rate, 
mean, any politician will come and say, my main aim is to increase the rate of growth. Is the rate of growth. They don't come in and say, I'm interested in increasing the mass of growth. But when you say, okay, Donald Trump, you're going to increase it by 4%, what's that going to do to the mass? Where's the mass going to be absorbed? How is it going to be, you know, how, how are you going to extract its resources to go to that 4%, you know? So they yeah. have to think about mass, not rate. Let me leave it there because there are many things I can discuss further about that. Peking University School of Marxist Studies, and all four of us a year ago about this time were at the second uh, Marxist conference. And uh, the beginning and the lecture, uh, ending lecture, were uh, given by David, uh, all uh, about really what he was talking here. It was about volume three of capital. And it was about how there is an inherent instability in every system, not only a capitalist system, but in ancient Greece and Rome, and Babylonia, and probably in uh, China too. And the instability was this compound growth of uh, finance capital growing much faster than any economy can keep up with. And the question for any economy is, how are they going to resolve this problem? Uh, I do not feel that uh, uh, his speech was very happily uh, received uh, at the other end. I think it bewildered them. Uh, talking about volume three, well, most people think uh, Marx is about volume one. So uh, this really should be the framework for discussing the end of history. And I, I, you know, what, what does it mean by the end of history? That's a euphemism for what Margaret Thatcher said, there is no alternative, Tina. It means history's going to come to an end. It means the end of social reform. It means the end of uh, societies, certainly Western civilizations, ability to deal with the inherent polarization and inequality that's caused by the uh, buildup uh, of debt. Uh, it's what Christians called the end time when this was happening uh, in ancient Rome. It meant uh, we don't see any way out. Uh, and I think that's why uh, uh, people voted uh, the way they were here uh, for Trump. They're saying, if this is the way we're going, let's just smash it up. It's the way that, uh, it's the reason why uh, uh, the British voted for Brexit. Uh, the term was, as you all know, was popularized in 1992 to celebrate the replacement of Soviet communism with neoliberal kleptocracy. Uh, what it meant was the end of Russian communism, the end, and it meant the end of the Russian economy. The neoliberals came in and they made a deal with the uh, leading uh, communist party apparatchiks. They said, if you will uh, register all of this property in your own name, uh, then you'll have it and uh, you'll get rich. All you have to do, obviously, if you have all the stock in uh, uh, Gazprom and uh, Nordos Nickel, uh, you're not going to get rich selling it to Russians because we've just wiped out all of their uh, uh, savings with the IMF uh, state, uh, uh, plan to get rid of what they call the savings overhand, meaning wipe out the savings of the entire population so that, and then uh, tell Russia that you can only pay your pensioners, only pay your labor in US dollars that uh, the Russian uh, government and employers did not have enough money to pay their, their labor uh, in rubles because they were told that for every ruble they created or paid, they had to have a US dollar backing it. And uh, I knew American fund managers, and they were making 100% interest per year lending to Russia at this time. Uh, the, the, the intention of all of this by the American planners was to make uh, the privatization and dismantling of government irreversible. That's what they meant by the end of history. It meant the end of the progressive era, the end of everything that the 20, early 20th century and late 19th century thought of as the reform uh, program. Uh, the reform was supposed, uh, that people thought were going to be the end of history was uh, not only what socialists talked about, 
but it was what uh, capitalist uh, uh, industrialists talked about. Uh, uh, and the idea was that if you have a uh, government subsidizing the basic means of uh, the basic needs, public utilities, education, health care, uh, then you will lower uh, the cost of labor because the employers will not have to pay for their workers to pay for an education or student loans or for health care or for transportation or for basic utilities. Then uh, the government subsidy will lower the wage costs so that industry in these countries that are, have a mixed economy, of which the United States was the leading example of the world in the 19th century, we will have a mixed economy that you can afford to undersell uh, countries that do not have uh, a mixed economy and uh, try to privatize and financialize uh, everything. Uh, this seemed to be the end of history, and it was believed that this would become a permanent revolution. This, it was believed that as countries, be, the socialism was viewed as the natural evolution of uh, industrial capitalism, uh, in the sense that uh, in, capitalism would put in place a form of efficiency and uh, low prices, and essentially it would get rid of the carryover of feudalism, the rentier class. It would uh, get rid of the landlords by taxing them away. It would get rid of the monopolists by uh, taking the monopolies into the public domain, as they did in uh, Britain under the Labor Party, uh, uh, in, in almost every uh, country, the basic monopolies like the world treated like the post office, and educational system, and public health were public. And also, uh, finance uh, was expected to be socialized. And with, uh, it was I, the idea was that socialism would be so much more efficient that it would be able to undersell. Uh, other countries, and all the countries were going to be obliged to uh, keep, uh, get rid of the carryovers of feudalism, get rid of the rent seekers, so everybody would earn the income that they had. There wouldn't be any coupon clippers, there wouldn't be any bondholders, rentiers, there wouldn't be any uh, idle rich, or what uh, John Stuart Mill called uh, landlords and rentiers making income in their sleep. So the idea was that socialism was defined as efficient capitalism. Uh, Marx pointed out that this was unlikely to happen without a revolution. And obviously we can see now that he was right. Uh, it, it, uh, it certainly took a revolution not only in Russia, but uh, right now uh, there's a armed uh, opposition in the world uh, to make sure that uh, the end of history is the end of this attempt to form, uh, uh, reform a democratic uh, kind of capitalism. And uh, the idea was that if you, uh, uh, you're really seeing a fight back of the uh, surviving interests from feudalism, a fight back by the wealthy 1% wanting to keep everything that they have, uh, wanting to keep uh, their financial ownership of uh, uh, the means of production, including the public utilities, including land, including uh, raw materials, uh, including uh, things that generate economic rent, the kind of things that Marx was talking about in volumes two and three of Capital, uh, where uh, he had expected the role of industrial capitalism was to solve all of this problem of getting rid of the rentiers, so that finally you could have the capitalist problem, how to deal with the conflict between labor and industrial capital. Uh, Obviously, what the end of history is seen by the neoliberals in Russia didn't have anything to do with labor industry or industrial capital. They didn't want any industry at all. Uh, the, under the Harvard boys, they came into Russia, used American money to buy up any uh, manufacturing industry they could on the theory that any manufacturing was potentially military, and they closed it down. So you had a closing down of Russian manufacturing of any kind of uh, self-sufficiency. And uh, in, instead, what you had was uh, uh, a focus on uh, raw materials, uh, nickel, oil, gas, uh, and uh, public utilities, such as the electrical uh, utility monopoly that Trubais uh, took over. So uh, the end of history was a kind of rhetorical public relations effort to prevent industrial capitalism. Uh, from developing in Russia, much less in industrial socialism from developing there. Uh, the idea was that it was going to be uh, a debt-ridden, privatized kleptocracy, not only in Russia, but in the West itself. The fight was uh, really to make uh, 
to make the end of uh, opposition to Thatcherism and Reaganism, the opposition to neoliberalism, saying there will not be uh, any alternative because uh, uh, we have uh, we foreclosed progress. So the question is, what makes uh, what this goes to the root of the whole train of Western civilization for the last two thousand years, and what really makes it Western? as opposed to the earlier takeoff of civilization in the ancient Near East, where you have almost all of the economic practices that are uh, surviving today, charging of interest, contracts, uh, prices, uh, money, all of this that was developed in the Near East. Uh, what, what, what Greece and Rome did that was different from all the other countries was uh, to make uh, progress irreversible. That's what linear progress means, irreversibility. Uh, and uh, prior to Greece and Rome, uh, every country would free itself from the kind of dynamics that David was talking about in his talk in the financial uh, economics. My book on uh, Forgive Them Their Debts is a history of uh, uh, Babylonia, Sumer, uh, and uh, Byzantium, uh, showing uh, how when every new ruler would take the throne, in uh, Sumer, Babylonia, from about 2500 BC down to uh, the first millennium, the ruler would cancel all of the consumer debts, all of the personal debts, all of the agrarian debts, and he would return the land been, that had been forfeited to large landowners to the actual cultivators. You have exactly the same phenomenon still being done in Byzantium in the ninth and 10th centuries of our eras. The whole idea is how does a society prevent uh, itself from polarizing and ending up just like Rome ended up, with uh, landowners and uh, uh, financiers controlling the whole thing. And they were actually able to do it by uh, the royal proclamations, by what was the equivalent of the uh, uh, biblical uh, jubilee uh, law. Well, Rome uh, really became the first society not to cancel the debts, not to get rid of debt bondage, and to polarize into a very self-destructive oligarchy that uh, uh, essentially dried up the domestic economy, preventing uh, growth. And so by the time that it was finally fell uh, to Gothic uh, fighters in uh, uh, fi uh, 510 of this era, it had already begun to, uh, uh, de uh, the population had begun to shrink, and the economy uh, was shrinking. So Rome had, an end of history, and what it was going through in its end of history is very much like today. Uh, and we all used to know what the end of history was before Fukuyama's book. It was what happens when history stops. Uh, and it happened before. Uh, they called it the Dark Age. And it was a dark age because uh, central uh, government fell apart, uh, the economic surplus fell apart. Uh, the, the land was concentrated in the hands uh, of a very narrow financial class and held together purely by military force and by a political assassination, which is the one common thread from the very beginning of the Roman Empire, of uh, the Roman Republic. Uh, uh, as, as soon as they overthrew the kings in 509 BC, the kings were reported to have canceled the debts. The oligarchy said, we don't want any central authority to overcome us. In other words, it was like this was the neoliberal, Rome was the neoliberal revolution of the 5th century BC. Uh, it it uh, made a constitution where only the, only the richest families can, could, could vote. It's just like the donor class today, but uh, the donor class in Rome was the only class that was able uh, to vote. Uh, and Rome sort of had the direction of history polarizing to a dead end. That, and uh, Fukuyama's book and the neoliberals celebrate the dead end. They say, this is what we want. With just in Russia, what they wanted was just a few people owning their own materials, and you don't need the Russian population to, to extract this oil, to extract this nickel. Uh, uh, as uh, Putin said, uh, neoliberalism killed more Russians than, uh, than uh, World War II. So the question is, uh, did the neoliberals uh, uh, achieve the uh, irreversible uh, uh, privatization in Russia, and even more, have the neo are the neoliberals going to achieve an irreversible stagnation and austerity that, make, that will make the United States economy and the European economy look like uh, essentially countries that borrow from the International Monetary Fund 
and uh, impose austerity. That's, that's really the issue of uh, what the end of history is today. And uh, the, uh, the, the media talked about the fight between America and Russia as the Thucydides problem. It says somehow the, uh, you, you have the right-wing neo-fascists in this country saying that the Thucydides problem is one country being jealous of another, like Athens was jealous of Sparta. This is a falsification of history. That, uh, Athens and Sparta didn't fight yeah. because they were jealous. They fought because Athens was a democracy and Sparta was an oligarchy, and the oligarchy was trying to overthrow uh, other country, uh, Athens and other parts of Greece militarily, as they did uh, in, uh, uh, in Athens when the, uh, uh, the group called the 30 of Spartan uh, proxies began to murder uh, all of the uh, Democrats. This is really what, uh, the, how history ended up, and it's the direction in which we're going in today. Thank you. Many years ago, uh, when I was a uh, college student and movement activist, uh, I decided to study economics or political economy. And the reason I decided to do that was I had this crazy idea that studying uh, political economy might shed some light on how to get beyond capitalism to socialism and how to interpret uh, any given current uh, situation in capitalist society and to figure out what possibilities it held for change. So what I'm going to do in my comments is uh, present an interpretation of the current situation in uh, global capitalism but focusing on uh, U.S. capitalism. This uh, interpretation is based on a theory called social structure of accumulation theory that was developed by U.S. Marxist economists in the early 1980s. Uh, and according to this view, uh, while capitalism has been around for a long time, it has taken different forms in different periods. Uh, and I'll, I'll give examples from the last 75 years for some 25 years after World War II, uh, there was in the US, also in Western Europe, and basically the whole capitalist world, a form of capitalism known as regulated capitalism, in which states played a major role in regulating uh, enterprises, in regulating markets, uh, in which there was a kind of compromise between capital and labor uh, over wages and working conditions. And this form of capitalism uh, worked very effectively for the capitalists for some 25 years. There was rapid uh, growth, uh, profits increased rapidly. Uh, it was a relatively uh, equally shared growth between capital and labor. It produced the fastest GDP growth of any long period in capitalist history. Some call it the golden age of capitalism. But uh, history suggests that every form of capitalism eventually uh, becomes destabilized. And it does so because it stops working effectively to promote further economic expansion. And when that happens, a period known as structural crisis emerges, and uh, change is suddenly in the air, when previously uh, it had been very difficult to change anything. And this happened in the 1970s. And those of us who were around at that time will remember that there was a sense of crisis that suddenly the economy, which had seemed to be working so well, so seamlessly, many of us on the left were frustrated. How can we organize workers to uh, struggle for socialism when their wages go up every year uh, and their benefits go up every year? Suddenly, uh, the economy wasn't working normally. There was rising unemployment, inflation, international instability in the international monetary system. And what happens in such periods of structural crisis and what has happened in the past is the form of capitalism has changed. A period of restructuring has happened. And what happened was at the end of the 70s, throughout the capitalist world, a new form emerged that today we call the neoliberal form of capitalism. In many ways, opposite to the earlier form. In place of a capital labor compromise, capital has strived to fully dominate labor and has been generally successful. 
in doing so. More successful in some places than in others, but a shift in every part of the capitalist world. Uh, the forms of state regulation that have benefited workers, that had attacked problems of uh, environmental damage, etc., were all weakened. Uh, taxes were cut on uh, the rich and on big business. Uh, the ideology of uh, neoliberalism said this would result in uh, rapid growth and trickle down their own benefit. That's not what happened. But the neoliberal form of capitalism uh, resolved the crisis of the 70s, it brought the inflation under control, and it led to some 25 years of long economic expansions uh, that were relatively stable, mild recessions until 2008. Uh, and it was much better for the capitalists. They became much richer. Wages trended downward after uh, 1980 rather than upward over time. And the share of the 1% skyrocketed. Corporate CEOs' pay went from about 25 times that of the average worker to more than 300 times that of the average worker. So neoliberal capitalism has been uh, very bad for the great majority, but you know, the answer was there is no alternative. And it seemed impossible to challenge it. Uh, when uh, political figures won office who had opposed many of the trends, uh, the labor government in the 90s, uh, the President Clinton in the 1990s in the US, labor government in Britain, Clinton uh, government in the US, uh, they ran opposing these trends, and instead the trends intensified uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. It just wasn't possible in most of those countries to oppose it. It didn't begin to uh, break out of the system in Venezuela, but to do that aside. Uh, then in 2008, the uh, contradictions of neoliberal capitalism undermined it. And I think since 2008, we've been in a period like the 1970s, like the 1930s, when the pre-existing form of capitalism is in its structural crisis phase. Uh, it is no longer producing normal expansion. The economy has been growing at about 2.2% per year uh, since, uh, since 2008. And this is below the rate at which it grew in the neoliberal era previously. Uh, there was very little uh, productive investment going on. And uh, the uh, inequality has intensified. And the neoliberal ideas have been delegitimized. The long period of increased suffering of working people, then the way the state uh, bailed out the bankers but did nothing for the homeowners who were losing their homes, uh, really delegitimized the system. You know, it turned out, as some people said, there was uh, socialism for the rich but capitalism for everyone else. And uh, millions of people have decided, hmm, maybe this other thing, socialism, might not be bad. Uh, you know, we'd like to uh, be helped in hard times, like the bankers were. It's of course, not exactly what socialism is, but that's another matter. So, in my view, we're in such a period. And analytically, the reason why neoliberal capitalism cannot promote normal economic expansion anymore is that it rested on debt-fueled consumer spending. Uh, rising inequality and rising profits, this stimulated business investment, but to have a long period of normal growth, total demand has to grow, and wages were falling, and government spending was not growing very fast. So who would buy the growing output of a growing economy? And that contradiction was resolved for 25 years by a combination of big uh, asset bubbles, uh, inflated, rapidly growing values of real estate corporate securities, and a financial system that, uh, based on those asset bubbles, was able to lend growing amounts of money to ordinary households so that they could continue to increase their spending despite their decreasing income. It was debt-fueled consumer spending that provided the growing demand. Since 2008, that has not been happening. There has not been debt-fueled consumer spending since then. Households have been paying off their debt. Uh, household uh, consumer spending is not growing relative to disposable income anymore. And that's, I think, the fundamental reason why neoliberal capitalism is no longer promoting normal expansion. This has been reflected in the political realm, where this kind of stagnation crisis, different from the crisis of the 70s, which was a crisis of rising inflation, 
and macroeconomic instability. The crisis of neoliberal capitalism is similar to the crisis of the 1930s, a crisis of the 1920s free market form of capitalism. And it takes the form of prolonged stagnation. And prolonged stagnation in capitalism destabilizes the state. It destabilizes the political structure. And it produces growing uh, political polarization, the rise of uh, uh, authoritarian movements to the right, as happened in the 1930s, the rise of fascism. And it promotes uh, the rise of left-wing movements with the growing interest in socialism that we're seeing today in the US in the UK and some other places. So in my view, uh, in this period, uh, there are two possible resolutions within capitalism to this uh, crisis of the form of capitalism. And I hope we can get beyond capitalism. But at this point, in my view, socialism, that is the replacement of capitalism by a system in which uh, ordinary people uh, own and control the means of production and use them to meet their needs and wants. Uh, that's not on the agenda uh, at the moment. But the neoliberal form, I think, is in its dying period. And there are two possible directions that a change may take uh, in the immediate future. And one is authoritarian right-wing nationalism. Everyone's noticed the rise of authoritarian right-wing nationalist leaders in many countries around the world, you know, Turkey, India, Poland, Hungary, uh, Brazil, and the US, the USA, that's Trump's politics. Trump ran against neoliberalism, uh, at least uh, verbally, uh, when he was a candidate for president. He defeated all these uh, Republican candidates who demanded you know, cuts in Social Security and Medicare. He said he'd protect them equal for protecting workers. I mean, he wasn't serious about protecting workers. But his, his arguments were right-wing nationalists, that the American workers are suffering because of, of what foreigners are doing to them, Mexicans. China, you know, it's the fault of uh, uh, Latinos, African Americans, etc. That was his politics. Uh, but when he took office, he faced a Republican majority in Congress that was neoliberal. And so his administration has been a coalition of right-wing nationalism and a more extreme neoliberalism. So we've seen uh, kinds of deregulation that are more extreme than before, uh, you know, attempts to, to completely cut regulation of dangerous chemicals that go into the environment, uh, turning the, the national uh, uh, lands, the national wildlife preserves, the national forests fully open to commercial development, uh, and enormous tax cuts for the rich, uh, attempts to transfer the edu public educational system into a uh, privatized system. But at the same time, while extreme neoliberalism reigns in uh, domestic, economic, and social policy, in uh, foreign policy, it's right-wing nationalist policy. It's uh, tariffs, uh, attempt to uh, uh, totally change the global uh, economic system, uh, uh, blocking immigration into the US. These are not neoliberal policies, and they're not supported by big business. In my view, Trump was not the candidate of any important section of big business. He was able to, to win the presidency with an appeal to diverse uh, constituencies uh, through mainly his right wing nationalist uh, appeals with a little bit of uh, genuflection to some traditional Republican calls for protecting Christians and uh, so forth. Uh, and uh, protecting, you know, cutting taxes, he began to mention that. Uh, so we have an incoherent regime in the U.S. right now, neither fully neoliberal nor fully authoritarian right-wing nationalist. A, a consistent authoritarian right-wing nationalist regime could resolve the current economic contradictions. I'm, I'm not advocating it. I gave one talk for a student group. Later, I, I, I heard that they, they thought I was in favor of Trump. No. Uh, but, you know, the Hitler regime in the 1930s did eliminate unemployment uh, through a massive spending program uh, for both militarization and infrastructure. Uh, they built the Autobahn, 
and his unemployment was driven to zero, practically, in Germany. So I think that was, that was Trump's model uh, when he kept talking about infrastructure. I mean, it's not just his background as a developer, but I think he had this idea of uh, how you could make the economy sing. So this could uh, bring a period of uh, relatively, quote, normal economic expansion through the continuation of full capitalist domination of labor with the demand problem solved by growing state spending for the military and for uh, all different kinds of infrastructure uh, construction. And such a regime, the ideology of such a program is extreme nationalism and racism uh, to solidify a base for it. Uh, and uh, that's what we're seeing, but it's not, that program is not emerging in the U.S. because it's not dominating the domestic economic uh, policy at this time. There is no infrastructure program. The Republicans in Congress would never vote for it. Uh, they're against it. They're neoliberals. They don't favor that kind of public spending. Uh, in some countries, there is a more coherent right-wing nationalist uh, program in places like uh, India and Turkey. Uh, but there's another possibility, and that is uh, uh, possibilities to the left, which I think should be understood as green social democracy. Uh, the conditions do change as history progresses, and society now faces environmental constraints that did not seem to be present in 1945. Uh, and a, uh, a regime of green social democracy, that is one based on capital labor compromise, with strong, you know, reinvigorated trade unions, wages rising in step with labor, labor productivity, an activist government that directly encouraged technological innovation, uh, investment in education, in infrastructure, uh, along with a big move against the danger of global climate change, but within the context of capitalism. Uh, capitalism's a big obstacle to making progress against uh, global climate change, but I think it is possible to make some progress through very intensive government regulation and intervention. Uh, to do it effectively would require a significantly planned form of capitalism. Uh, but here's, I guess, the final point I want to make, and that is, obviously, I think the most promising future for working people at this time is a turn toward green social democracy. And we see this possibility in the U.S with Bernie Sanders' political appeal, which has been copied by many of the other Democratic candidates, whether sincerely or not, and by uh, Jeremy Corbyn in the UK. Uh, they're both very popular uh, positions, uh, but historically, uh, that form of, of capitalism is a form of capitalism, social democratic capitalism. It's a regulated form with labor having a lot of rights, has only emerged when the capitalist class uh, either could not stop it or feared something worse. Uh, and in Sweden, they couldn't stop it because a socialist working class based party controlled the government and imposed it on capital. But in most of the capitalist world, the capitalists after World War II accepted social democracy because they feared socialism, which was rising in the world at that time. And I think. Uh, uh, John Kennedy, President Kennedy's father, Joe Kennedy, a big capitalist who supported the New Deal, they typified this view when he reported to have said, I would gladly part with half of my fortune if that is what's necessary to keep the other half. <laughs> he was speaking hyperbolically. It's not known that he ever parted with half of his fortune. You get the idea. He supported Social Security, etc. U.S. big business after World War II, as I documented in my book, the rise and fall of neoliberal capitalism. U.S. big business supported uh, uh, the welfare states, they supported social security, they supported collective bargaining, and they supported Keynesian policies to keep the unemployment rate relatively low. It's a different period. But that's not going to happen again unless there's a growing socialist movement. So as socialists, I think we have a crucial role to play. Uh, I think socialists need to build a growing socialist movement in the U.S., taking advantage of the fact that some tens of millions of people say and answer to public opinion polls that they think socialism will be better than capitalism, whatever they might think that is, we need to fill that in as best we can with something real, a really different system. Uh, 
because even the chance of averting a fascist future uh, depends on uh, moving instead to the green social democracy route, which if we can build a growing socialist movement, help build a stronger trade union movement, this will make green social democracy possible and can prepare the way for eventually, in the next stage, getting to socialism. Because green social democracy has three key problems. It leaves uh, the basic contradictions of capitalism and its oppressions, <clears throat> uh, not just of workers, but oppressions based on race, ethnicity, gender, etc., in place. Uh, but uh, it cannot last uh, because capitalists hate it. And eventually, they'll have an opportunity to dismantle it. And they will dismantle it. Uh, and the third problem is it kind of fully resolves the contradiction between humans and nature. Only a socialist system can get rid of the endless uh, drive to produce more and more commodities that will never, in the long run, be consistent with environmental sustainability. So, so socialists do not need to feel like they're selling out if they support and try and help the uh, direction of green social democracy, but we can't immerse ourselves in it. We have to build an independent socialist movement that will both make green social democracy possible and ultimately a socialist future, which is the only future for the species in the long run. Thank you. We just had the Russian Social Forum with 400 participants from all over the countries, first time after 10 years. And we have these intentions, it's not only good garden ideas. So, uh, why the end of the end of the history? Uh, first point, first idea. Because they are afraid. They top officials, top bureaucracy and uh, big capital. They are afraid. Why can I say so? Uh, two only facts. One is the report to the President of the United States, 2018. Main threat is the European socialism. Of course, in Europe we do not have socialism, but in comparison with the United States, free of church education in universities is uh, even communism, we do not think of socialism. Uh, second, uh, the article in the Economist, uh, mainstream neoliberal journal, with the same problem, a uh, young generation uh, vote for socialism. And the same name, uh, the same names, uh, Corbyn, Sanders, uh, they forgot about Yellow West, of course, they forgot about uh, Venezuela struggle for socialism, uh, they didn't take into account that uh, in Russia the best period for Russian people is period of real socialism, 1970s, even now, even for young generation. So, we have a lot of facts uh, that uh, left ideas are important and the influence of these ideas is growing. Uh, why they are afraid? Why establishment is afraid of left ideas and why they are talking about this now? After 30 years of the victories, victories and so, and so on and so far. Victories maybe not in direct um, form. First, we have uh, 
not so ready to I can have I can say even stagnation in technological progress. We are talking now a lot about technological revolution, but if we compare the number of robots in the 1970s, 1970s, and now the number of these machines is more or less the same. The problem is that during 50 years it was big fall. And now we have again robots. First time I saw film with absolutely optimized enterprise producing, producing I don't know, this, Shripniki, something for machines. It was in 1972 when I was student. Enterprise without any one worker in Soviet Union. We have the same planes. I came here, I spent it, uh, 10 hours and it was the same as 50 years ago. But we have now a real challenge. We have new productive forces. And te technically, it is not a big problem to create automized, autom uh, uh, how to say, robots production merely for everybody. To give to people opportunity to spend their time in working places as people. To make creative work in education and healthcare in producing uh, books, novels, uh, films, and so on, to be bad people, not to make what machines can do. So we have technical basis for, not even socialism, for communism. It's the same like in the uh, 18th century, when machines came, when steam machines came, it was basis for capitalism everywhere. And then it was 200 years of the struggle between feudalism and capitalism. So now we have technical basis for communism, but in principle, not as actual. Uh, why they are afraid also of um, socialism? Because people started to understand that they are doing useless things. It was opinion poll in the United States. Do you think your job is useful for people? 50% said no. <laughs> this is terrible. And as a professor, I can say, there is a huge sector of economy which is useless. It's, by the way, a new idea from our country for Marxist political economy. Not simply first division, second division, but useless sector. In the United States, uh, I'm speaking on the memory, 20% uh, of GDP, finance, more than 15%, commerce, trade, enormous uh, malls and shopping as main sphere of the life. 10% uh, uh, useless service uh, of uh, uh, transactions in transactions transaction service plus military spendings plus bureaucracy in corporations and in the state so nearly 50% of economy is doing useless things useless from the point of view of development of personality technological social brain progress and they feel this. They feel this and we feel this. Next point, why they are afraid of this? Growth of inequality. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation of Professor Harvey, so I will not continue to go into these details. Fifth point, uh, they finally understood that even in the situation of neoliberal dictatorship, uh, so-called social or socialist uh, capitalism in uh, Scandinavian countries, is better than neoliberal. There are a lot of statistics. This report to the President of US made an attempt to criticize this statistic, but statistic is a statistic, even such bad as we have. The first place is uh, index of happiness. First place is Scandinavian countries. GDP for 80% of the poor people, relatively poor, so except 20% of the rich. GDP per capita will be bigger in Scandinavian countries than in the United States and so on and so far. Innovation. First place is in the innovation rating. Finland, Sweden, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, not US. This is international statistics. Even in these terrible conditions of the decline of socialization. So finally they understood it's, there is a real threat. What is the next point? What has to be done? I think they put the same question as Lenin 100 years ago. Uh, even more than 100 years ago. But they made another answer. Uh, and uh, David Coates 
and uh, other speakers already said about this. It's uh, conservative liberalism. What does it mean? They want to continue the same model of capitalism as we have now, as they have now. So domination of financial sector and financialization of all uh, aspects of the life, uh, totalitarian market of manipulators, I will stress this. They're making money not from the technological progress mainly, they're making money mainly through manipulation. They uh, create circumstances when we must uh, uh, go for the useless work in order to buy useless things, in order to create image that we are great persons among people whom we hate. <laughs> this is the goal of the life, it's not funny. For 90% of population. We hate the work, we hate the things, we hate people around ourselves. This is a alienation and very simple explanation what does it mean. But they want to continue existence of this situation through manipulation. They created not simply consumer society. In the situation of uh, social differentiation, they created a society of simulacra. We are buying not very good quality, I don't know, shirt. We are buying shirt with signature here, something, Chanel. If it is normal shirt, it will be five dollars. If it is Chanel or I don't know what else, it will be five thousand dollars. Of course, it will be much better. Do you know what is here? Chanel or nothing? Or uh, something like red, red, red factory from Russia? <laughs> this is not again funny. So, uh, market of manipulations producing simulacra. This is a model how they have their hegemony. And they want to cons uh, consult this to, to prevent any changes. The same with uh, domination of financial speculations and bureaucracy. And they use budget mainly for their profit. I don't know about US, but in Russia it's very visible. Budget of Russian state is used for the money, for the making money, for the making profit by big corporations for the oligarchs. So socialism is working for capital. It's one of the paradoxes of neoliberals. How to make it uh, strong or stronger than now, when there is threat from the left? Very simple. To start conservative symbol. To start conservative policy, ideology, and it will be authoritarian system in political life. And I don't know if you or not, but in Russia we feel that there is growth of authoritarian tendencies. In ideology, this is nationalism plus great power chauvinism, plus clericalism. In some Russian universities we must pray the God before a conference. It's not joke. I don't know, maybe it will be a uh, little late in the United States. Maybe you will pride not God, but Trump, I don't know. We are not your, of course. So, to cut democracy, to cut uh, opportunities of civil society, freedom of speech, uh, and very important aspect, extremely important aspect, left uh, trend in universities. Uh, when I was young, first time came to the US, it was uh, a lot of universities with Marxist scholars uh, and lectures on Marxism. At least in Europe and in the United States also. Now I see a few people who can do this in universities as main job, as main trend and so on. So, uh, and that's why I struggle for the left intellectual alternative in universities is an extremely important front of the struggle against this conservative liberal. So, I will stop here because I don't have too much time. What can be left alternative? Of course, uh, this presentation is not a good space uh, because I have another seven minutes or something like that. Uh, and it is big uh, discussion. Uh, a few points uh, which are important from the point of view of uh, our left democratic internationalist movements from social forum. So first, uh, we must uh, change many slogans of social democracy of 1960s and of revolutionary left movement of 1960s. Uh, and the paradox is that uh, new left of 1960s, who became now old left, you see, we are not very young. <laughs> but the paradox is that we can propose new uh, alternative, different from the ideas of 1960s in some aspects because we have some lessons uh, of the history, not of the end of the history, but of the history. 
And uh, I can say, at least this is my opinion now, uh, we must think about qualitative change of the society. If we don't have a strategic goal, all tactical reforms will be useless. In Russia we have proverb, no one wind will be useful for you if you don't know in what direction you are going. <laughs> so, uh, I think it's time to say, we are going in the direction of not even socialism, but communism. Society without social alienation. In all spheres. Society, when you are going for the work which you like, and work for you is pleasure. Not something terrible. Not something what you must minimize according to economics. This is the dogma. Work which is pleasant. And distribution according to the needs is distribution of work. Because main need is work. This is very old idea, but this is just what we must say now. Because we have, again, technical opportunities to have work as pleasure. For majority. Four hours of bad work and then interesting work for everybody. <coughs> this is technically possible now. For everybody, not only for the US. We have enough, enough wealth. Go in order to have not expensive simulacra things, but beautiful, individual, useful things. Things must be beautiful, individual. <coughs> Look how we are dressed. Like, like an army, really. We have a little bit different shirts, but we have all jeans, and we are not trying to be beautiful. I don't know, am I right or not, but uh, I think this is important. It was check of expression that in personality everything must be beautiful. Soul, body and dress. I don't have also beautiful dress, I'm sorry. <laughs> but this is simple for people, they must have values. When they have left person who will, uh, and then they will ask, is it an uh, art object or this is garbage? He said, no, everybody must decide what is it. I think we must uh, think clearly what is communism, what is strategic goal. And we must say that it is quality, quanti, uh, not quantity, but quality gap between modern society and future society. But then we can say, we need reforms in order to move in this direction. And if we have very successful reforms, very good. They have socialized capitalism, with strong trade unions, green organizations, a real self-management in the capitalist enterprises, with free of charge education like in Finland and so on and so forth. So, only one step, victory in the uh, elections, and we have first stage of communist society. If we have successful, deep, new reforms, it's very simple to jump into new society. If they will not give us opportunity to make these reforms, will be revolution, and I am not afraid to talk about this. Quality change of the society. And I think it's time to say, we are supporters of reforms in order to have peaceful quality change, but if they will not allow us to make reforms, we are decisive enough to make revolution. give us opportunity to make reforms. They must have threat. Or they will never give us opportunity to make big reforms. Even reforms. So, very quickly about reforms. First, socialization, not state, uh, so society, not state, is main uh, subject of uh, property regulation and so on. Very important, because state now is uh, under the control of top big capital and top bureaucrats. So, nationalization very often is useless, even dangerous, at least in Russia. So, socialization. Socialization of production. Typical slogan of social democracy, socialization of distribution. Our slogan, socialization of production. Real control of the working people over production, even in the frameworks of the capitalism, as deep reform. Uh, second, uh, not only subsidies, or not, not mainly subsidies, idea of all social democracy, but new high-tech working places in social sector for those who don't have jobs. And education and re-education through all life for everybody free of charge. This is reform. This is inside capitalism. This is like in Finland. 
This is not something communist in general. But how difficult it is to do this? Next step. Uh, very big front of the struggle, intellectual private property. Our alternative is uh, property, intellectual property, culture, open for everybody. Property of everybody on everything as alternative to intellectual private property. Very important slogan for the left, especially for the left intellectuals. And everybody knows this, but it's necessary to put into the gym. Uh, if you got about money for this, typical question, you don't have money for this, you know how to distribute, you don't know how to produce. How to produce. We do know how to produce. Because if you produce on the basis of uh, property of everybody on everything, we don't have terrible transactional costs for uh, uh, specification of property rights on intellectual private property and protection of property rights. If we have socialized production, it is uh, Productive production, if I can say so. It's technically progressive production. And we can have a lot of progress because of the changes of the structure. If we will use electric bikes, it will be faster to move than uh, in huge cars as in the United States. I can continue, but this is not the case. The idea is to say maybe final point. Uh, culture can be the key question for the changes of the society. It was uh, understandable even for Bolsheviks uh, more than 100 years ago. If people will not be included into the real culture, not Hollywood-style uh, quasi-culture, they will never move in the direction of socialism. So struggle for the humanistic culture, definite culture oriented on the definite beauty, not something else, not postmodernist, everything is beautiful, everything is ugly. This is the key idea. So if we put all this together, it will be a program of reforms which will prepare revolution or which will be not allowed. If they are not allowed, it will be very good. I'm sorry for this radical paper, but uh, maybe I was very angry about Russian
credit exchange money, credit exchange money into the next day. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry I got calls. I do because it's noisy. You should get a robot to do that. <laughs> yes, sir. You're welcome. <laughs> so, I have a question for Sasha. So, I'm glad to hear you quote from Bob Dylan, actually. But you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. That was uh, the theme of the actually weatherman movement here, and, now, and you were sort of saying the same thing about the direction of the wind. So, with the production being done by robots and by automation, then how can where is the funds come from under capitalism for workers to buy what's produced <coughs> if the if they're not working anymore. And the second question has to do with also the environmental consequences of that development of machinery and technology and ripping apart the earth. So how do you account okay. for that in, in what you're saying? Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, just a comment about uh, Dr. Robson's historical analysis. As a native of Iran, I Left, I felt left out that you didn't mention the third cousin. You, this is typical, I mean, the Eurocentrism in uh, Western analysis. That they talk about Greece, Rome, Greece, Rome. How about Persia? They're the same third cousin, same ethnicity, same linguistic, same mythology, and they have no slaves. But it's taboo to mention them because Europe separated from them. You mentioned uh, Babylon and Sumer, which is the states of the Persian Empire. The Persian Empire was very benevolent. It lasted for about a, day, a millennia. So I just want to, we miss uh, Samir Amin. He has written about this. OK. You yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I have also one question to, to David Curry, uh, if it's possible on the sure. panel. Yes, uh, yeah, sir David, you wrote a wonderful book uh, about contradictions of capitalism. But do you see now a new specific main contradiction of capitalism? Because in all the or classic Marxism, it was the idea that there is key or main contradiction of capitalism, private social, uh, socialized production, private property, private capitalist property. Uh, do you think it's the same now, or we have now new, qualitatively new contradiction of capitalism, or maybe post-capitalism? Yeah? So maybe we will give the opportunity. Okay, a lot of yeah, yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, give the floor uh, the tradition. Uh, first of all, ladies, uh, okay, because we must have a balance. I'm now a skilled guy. Uh, in Russia, we don't have this uh, as main idea, but here it's very important. Ladies, okay, only uh, only men. Okay, your word. I'm going to uh, ask a question that relates to. Um, growth of the international domestic economy and the emergence of um, this kind of catastrophe that we're in the midst of. How can we um, have economic growth that's predicated on um, removing um, all of the um, imperfections that were possibly used to uh, you know, bring forth? Um, when the, the Green New Deal talks about you know, the, the uh, development of maybe millions of, of windmills, millions of solar panels, they didn't require fossil fuel inputs in their machines so we can produce that. So my question is, can we have economic growth and move to a more uh, post-industrial, quasi luddite economy? Um, and what are the political implications? OK, thank you. Uh, maybe your neighbor, yes. Okay. Yeah. The question is this. I, mean, I appreciate the analysis. But this analysis of half of the hemisphere, the northern is the South absent because it doesn't count or is not relevant? And South, I'm talking Africa, I'm talking Latin America, I'm talking big chunks of Asia that were left out of the, the picture. They don't count. The interrelation of South doesn't count. Okay, very important question. And yes, a young person near you. Uh, I would like to know. I'm, I, I'm glad that you are young. I'm a little mystified. Uh, why, why do we keep hearing about authoritarian capitalism or absolute capitalism? Why are we not talking about fascism? Now, I just wrote a book about the origins of American fascism. And the implications of my book are that in the epicenter of the capitalist system after World War I, fascist processes 
terrorist and non-terrorist alike, meaning the brutality on the one hand and commodification and manipulation and deception on the other were absolutely necessary to sustain capitalist accumulation during the boom of the 1920s. This is a benchmark for all future capitalist growth in the world capitalist system in the contemporary epoch. So my question is this, if my predecessors, in my book, the people that I brought to life back again, who were buried by liberal historians, if they defined fascism as the rule of finance capital itself, and they sustained capitalist accumulation through brutality and manipulation, how is it that what was embryonic in the 20s and 30s with respect to the American behemoth, which is now full grown, full grown, how is it that we're still talking about authoritarian right-wing nationalism instead of fascism? Okay. This is a mystery to me. Thank you. So now yeah. I will ask, please, uh, uh, let's stop for a minute and uh, three, four minutes for everybody to comment. Uh, Mike, uh, you want, okay. Then maybe David Harvey, David Ford, and me. But please, three minutes, okay? Sure. Okay, the first question was on uh, at how do you go forward from Adam Smith? Well, you go all the, for, uh, all the way to 1848 with uh, John Stuart Mill, uh, when you had the revolutions in Europe. Uh, and as we all know, that didn't go far enough because all they wanted to do and 1848 was to uh, over get rid of the landlords and the monopolists. Uh, they didn't care very much about labor. And that was why Marx wrote his uh, first volume of Capital, to find out that just as uh, the rentiers were exploited, in, so uh, were the uh, industrial capitalists uh, as employers. And uh, the, uh, Marx had expected capitalism to solve the carryover from feudalism problems. But as we all know, that didn't work. Uh, and uh, they haven't solved them, and uh, the neo-feudal rentier interests are even stronger today than before. Uh, second question is about David Graeber and debt P and H. Uh, that is the end of history. Uh, if the what was just called uh, the fascists uh, have their way, that'll be the end of history. You'll have a uh, dependent class uh, without having uh, any of the economic surplus that's monopolized uh, at uh, the very top. Uh, Regarding uh, Iran, quite uh, all of the Near East, from Sumer, Babylonia, uh, to Iran, when Iran conquered Babylonia, it left the local uh, administrations to the Babylonians, and Herodotus uh, in his history uh, points out that the Iranians canceled, when a new ruler would come to the throne, they would cancel the debt. So Iran was able uh, to be free of uh, a debt P&H, uh, and Herodotus describes the Iranians as having a loathing of debt precisely because that led you to be in free. But even in the 5th and 4th centuries BC, Babylonia was pretty much free of uh, uh, debt P&H and uh, uh, debt slavery. This was Greece and Rome. This is Western civilization introduced permanent, irreversible debt P&H that was always only temporary throughout the entire rest of uh, the Near East. Uh, and the final question, again, is uh, fascism. Well, uh, what uh, I think that Trotsky had uh, the, the correct definition of fascism in the 30s. He said, fascism arises when the socialist parties are unable to put forth an alternative. And uh, that's pretty much what we have today. I don't see uh, the, uh, the socialist parties are not talking about finance. They, I think they've been so in, infiltrated uh, 60 years ago uh, we used to say, ladies, gentlemen, and members of the FBI. Well, uh, that's because we had to depend on someone to pay the dues. Uh, and uh, obviously, there were enough of them to uh, make sure that uh, uh, the, uh, the so-called uh, socialist movements they took over, uh, like CIA heads, like the Marucci uh, in, in, uh, influence, and like uh, the, uh, what the CIA did in Italy uh, to take over the left-wing movements. You have uh, a... Uh, uh, a socialist movement that doesn't talk about economics. So uh, that's what's made uh, fascism possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, David, maybe you. Well, I'll just respond to a few of the, the questions. Uh, the one about, there are two, two questions about robots and production. Uh, uh, 
for a long time, there have been claims that uh, mechanization is going to replace human labor. I, mean, I remember in the 1950s, there in the U.S., there was a report published, The Triple Revolution, which warned that uh, soon there would be uh, no more jobs in America. And that was followed in the 1960s by rapid economic growth and a very low unemployment rate. Uh, I think the data actually show that uh, in the capitalist epoch, uh, when technological change is faster and uh, workers are being, late, direct labor is being replaced more rapidly by mechanization, that employment actually grows faster. And uh, it seems counterintuitive, but there's a reason for this, and that is while each act of mechanization replaces some direct labor, it also increases profitability for the capitalists, and that encourages them to uh, invest, and production expands, and throughout the economy, uh, more workers are hired. I mean, over time, the number of wage laborers in the world has just kept going up and up and up. So I don't think uh, robots are, in the capitalist era, going to replace direct labor. Another way to think of it is, uh, to the extent that workers are replaced so rapidly, that it does generate rising unemployment, that will push wages down because workers' bargaining power falls, and that makes workers more attractive as subjects of exploitation, and some capitalists will find a way to hire them to make a profit off their labor. So I don't think uh, that is in, our, in the future of capitalism. In a socialist society, that's a matter of social decision. You know, how much of direct labor do we want to, to uh, replace? with machines, presumably you know, robots and mechanization would replace the unpleasant uh, kinds of labor, but I think human beings have a need to contribute to the reproduction of material life. I think people are most happy and most satisfied when they're participating in some form of social production of goods or services, and that uh, what technological change will do under socialism is to develop forms of labor that uh, have a positive effect on human beings, on their development, and use their creativity. And the root and repetitive forms will be minimized, although I have to confess, sometimes I like to be repetitive labor. But that's another matter. Uh, uh, now, why, why authoritarian right-wing nationalism rather than fascism? Uh, uh, you know, what's in a word? Uh, the term fascism has been used often to refer to a certain form of uh, state and society uh, that is associated with uh, Nazis and Mussolini in the 1930s. And uh, those uh, forms had certain features, including a, uh, a kind of a mass movement associated with it uh, that isn't always present in what we're seeing today. You know, Trump didn't have a fascist movement organized movement, an organization. That's one of his problems. He didn't have cadres. He didn't have an SS to fill, fill in key positions in his administration. So certainly what I'm calling authoritarian right-wing nationalism is I'm thinking of that as a broader term that includes fascism as a specific uh, example of it. And it's not always been dominant. I mean, fascist regimes arose in the 1920s and 30s, and then they were defeated uh, in World War II. Uh, and uh, we had, uh, you know, bourgeois democracy was dominant in at least the developed capitalist countries. And then, although there were various forms of dictatorship in much of the, what was then called the third world, now we're seeing a resurgence of a very similar form. And, you know, maybe we should call it fascism. I don't think that's, that's a crucial issue. And then I, I can't resist saying something about, about debt. Uh, I mean, David Graeber's book has had a lot of influence. Uh, there are many ways, angles from which you can try and understand human society, and one of them is uh, the debtor-creditor relation, because that goes way back in human history. But another is uh, the production direction of uh, who owns and controls the means of production and who does the labor. And Marx uh, presented that second uh, approach, the understanding of class understood in that sense, the appropriation of surplus. In my view, that's the best entry point for understanding contemporary societies, although debtor-creditor relations also play a role in, in all of these uh, modes of production, which, however, are understood as uh, 
centered around ways of appropriating the surplus. So I don't think starting from debt, viewing human history as an evolution of the debtor-creditor relation is the most illuminating about understanding human history or pointing toward a future which has to be not mainly debt-free, but classless. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, David Harley. Um, uh, come on, on uh, disagreements. Um, I, I, I should disagree with some of David Cox's account of neoliberalism um, for one reason, and it's one word, China. Uh, what's going on in China right now is very, 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 very significant for global history. Uh, in purchasing power parity measures, China is the largest economy in the world. And it got there in about 20 years. It's now a leading power in artificial intelligence. And we see with uh, organizations like Huawei, which were nothing 10 or 15 years ago, they now have the best 5G technology anywhere. And I think what's happening in China uh, can't be looked at as the conventional story of what happened here in the United States. Uh, and uh, the very moment when the crash occurred in 2008, for instance, uh, construction basically stopped in uh, this part of uh, the world, by the cement statistics, China leapt up in a huge, huge expansion. Huge. I mean, when I talk about the mass, I'm really talking here of the Chinese thinking about new cities which contain something like 130 million people. One city, 130 million people. That's like population of, of Britain, Germany, and France put together in one city. And they've got about six of them, which they're really beginning to design and, and to implement. Tremendous amount of demand coming not only from final demand, which is important in terms of that, but from investment what Marx called productive consumption. Most of the demand in China is coming from that. But, uh, again, the story that's been told of what's happening here, the leveraging of debt, individual debt in China has leapt up hugely since 2008. So what's going on there is something which is radically different. Radically different. And the global economy has been divided, if you like, between this part of the world, which is all austerity and all the kind of nonsense had in this country, what we've seen in Europe as well. And then we see what's happening in China and everything that hands on to China. This is a different, this is a different world. What's going on in terms of labor relations? I mean, people think, well, well maybe the working class has disappeared because the factories have disappeared. They've got factories in China. And Foxconn employs 1.5 million people okay, in about 50 factories across China. This is, this is, this is, this is, this is big. Now, there are other things which are going on, which is, has a lot to do with the way in which the market system is being set up in China, which again is not in pure neoliberal terms at all, it's something rather different. But there's something interesting about the market system, which goes back to the question of Adam Smith and all the rest of it. The free market is actually, from Marx's analysis, no problem. The problem arises in the free market when you start to have competition, not general competition, but competition that equalizes the rate of profit. So when you get to volume three of capital, Marx is talking about what happens when there's an equalization of the rate of profit. And the answer is you get what he calls capitalist communism. From each capitalist according to the labor they employ, to each capitalist of course, according to the capital they advance. Which means that there's a subsidy that is constantly flowing through the free market system, which is why advanced countries like the free market system because the constant subsidy flows from labor intensive industries and labor intensive countries and labor intensive activities to the capital intensive. And the capital intensive is protected increasingly by private property rights and technological uh, monopolies. And here's one of the big things we should be asking about. Why is it that intellectual property rights are put upon knowledge? Knowledge is a commons. Knowledge should be free in everybody. I'm glad the Chinese are stealing. <laughs> and, and, and actually, that, if you could free up technology, because right now what, what Trump is doing is trying to protect the United States, keep
keep China in the low uh, cap their labor intensive industry so that you can suck out the money out of China. China's going the other way. No, no, no. Because they saw very early that if you did capital intensive stuff, then at a certain point you'd have a different kind of world. For instance, Singapore. Singapore decided it was not going to go for uh, labor intensive industries. It went for capital intensive industries. And look how well Singapore has done. And China looks at that and says, okay, Singapore did that. But Singapore's a small little place. China's so fucking big uh, that when they do it, the whole world is going to be. Now, they've run into this problem of what to do about the mass. Okay. I have a map of Chinese foreign direct investment. In 2003, hardly any anywhere. By the time you get to 2015, a flood of it all over the world. And now it's Belt and Road and all this stuff going on in Africa and all this stuff going on in Latin America. And people ask about what's going on in the global south. That's an interesting question. I don't like the term global south because for a long time, China was in the global south. And I'm a geographer. I know it's in the north. <laughs> but now it really is in the north because there it is in Zambia and all these kinds of things dominating in the copper industries and, and extractivism and dominating in land acquisitions in Africa and all this kind of stuff. This is, a, this is a world which is really, really changing very, very rapidly. And I think we're very naive if we think that somehow or other uh, the story we're telling us about what's going on here is what's really going to matter. What's really going to matter is what's crucial to what is going to happen in China. Because it's not a done deal. I used to have this argument with Giovanni Uridi. Is it a done deal that China's got capitalist? They still talk Marx like crazy. And people, you know, people go there, and well, we were there, and you kind of, kind of say, this like, sounds like a lot of hot air. But no, I think there's a real belief in a lot of that. And, and where it will go, and how it will go, and how all this stuff will be used is a big kind of question. And that's, to me, the big question I would have. Very short comment, uh, comments for very important and big questions. First about automatization of production. Uh, first of all, I think, and I'm sure I don't think, uh, that uh, under the conditions of capitalism, full automatization of production is impossible. So it's not very important to talk about full automatization uh, if we have capitalism. Key idea which I wanted to present is simple. There are opportunities for automatization of production, but this is not the only question, or maybe not the main question. Main question is to change the whole system of production and not to produce useless things. It's not necessary to produce, uh, I don't know, billions of cars. It's simply useless. And so on. So, yeah, that's why the problem is to change completely structure of production and to make it really green, social, humanistic. And this is an extremely complex question, which will be a key question for future social society. And partly, maybe a little bit, it's the frameworks of capitalism, if they are strong enough to force them to change structure of production because of the uh, strong industrial policy, planification, and so on, in the frameworks of market economy. But it will be a little bit part and so on about uh, negative consequences of uh, automatization. Automatization is not system of enormous amount of uh, robots in the factories producing useless things for consumption of everybody in enormous quantities, in, in, uh, in a, a lot of I don't know, things, yeah, a lot of things. The idea is to produce uh, some interesting elements from which we can design something beautiful. And what people will do? I said on the previous session, key question of future society is question of free time, not today, because today we don't have free time. Even professors have three jobs and no free time at all. But uh, in the new society with big productivity and without a useless sector, we have enormous problem. What and how, how can we organize free time in order to make uh, personality creative, developing, uh, harmonic person? and not uh, element of consumer or uh, simulacra society. This is a key question, and I don't uh, have time to discuss this question. Also very important about South. Key question of South is not a uh, problem of uh, absence of uh, technical opportunities for development. 
uh, key question is imperialist oppression of the South. And by the way, I came also from South. Russia is of the South. And the, from the point of view of uh, geopolitical economy. So, uh, we, we cannot buy high-tech equipment in our country. Uh, in the United States, 1% of population, even less than 1% of uh, not population labor force, produce enough food for everybody. Why in uh, India or in uh, Latin America or in Africa or in Russia people cannot produce enough food when uh, they have 20-30% of working in agriculture? Because of the intellectual private property mainly. This is a key question. So, uh, of course, it's necessary to talk about South, but uh, the complex of problems is more or less the same. When I put this problem, I took it from the resolution of Russian social forum. And Russia, as I said, is a semi-periphery country, partly in the South. Uh, one important question about also growth. Uh, I think uh, we have to talk, and this is not my personal opinion, this is very well known, but I want to stress, not about growth about development, green, social, humanistic oriented development. And if we want to have such development, it can be decline of gross national product and progress of human qualities, uh, salvation of ecological problems and so on. If we will cut production of cars, or at least private cars, it will be decline of GNP. No production of cars, no production of equipment for cars, no production of steel for cars, no policemen, uh, no insurance, uh, no school for drivers, the trial of GNP and much better life. <laughs> yeah? This is a funny example because I don't have time. So about fascism, uh, I, I hate fascism and in Russia fascism is the most dirty word about if you say that you are fascist, it, uh, it is the most terrible what you can say about a person, then you must kill you. Yeah, if he is not fascist, <laughs> or if he is fascist. Uh, but uh, there is scientific definition, and for us, fascism is a system when people are oppressed uh, by capital through the direct violence of the state and through the corporative, corporativization of people. And the uh, oppression uh, by financial capital uh, together with bureaucracy now is indirect manipulation in the frameworks of formal democracy. In some aspects, even, this is even more dangerous than fascism because manipulation is invisible. But still it is not fascism, at least from academic point of view. This is my answer. But I agree that we must fa uh, struggle against all these trends altogether. So now we have to continue. We have a little bit time, no? So, uh, Maybe two more questions, three more questions, uh, mainly from the young generation. So, and women. Okay, Jeffrey, you are welcome. Yes. I'm not the young generation, but I have a question at hand. You are. Uh, my question is regarding the dangers of humanity, for example, nuclear arms and the use of nuclear arms and climate change, and how to incorporate in a more uh, in a more aggressive way, these issues into what we're saying about improving quality of life. Okay, thank you. Yes, you. Uh, in the context of reform, uh, what do you think of the argument that every reform is just a step back, like a minor retreat for capital, so they can take more power? Than okay, like, thank you. Important question. Yes, on the top it was hand. No, no, you are welcome. Yes. Um, I think that. In the future now, uh, what we're all saying is the democratization of the workplace, and I think a big part of that coming up is worker cooperatives. And I was just wondering, what do you, what does the panel think about how worker cooperatives are viewed now? What is their presence in the economy, and what can be done to protect them in the future to help them grow and encourage more? Okay, thank you. And on the top, yes. Oh, oh, okay, everybody. In the green, okay. Yeah, uh, so okay. Left, right. I think it's kind of related to the question that uh, this comment brought up earlier, which is this argument that like, we need like, green social democracy and then that kind of leads into socialism. And uh, I think it's somewhat dangerous in like, kind of thinking about like the way that reforms function in the capitalist milieu, right? So, like, often reforms are used to stifle like, further revolutionary activity. Right, so you know, 
the capitalist class throws, throws the working class on the bones and you know we get some reforms or whatever, and then 20 years down the road they take it away and then we're right back into square one, which I think is where we are in terms of the labor movement right now. And um, especially considering you know climate change, like we don't really have much time to get thrown for a loop. Okay, thank you. And the in green, oh, little bit green. More or less green, yes. Yeah, uh, so like when we talk about debt, we also talk about individual and household debt. I was just wondering if you guys can comment on the problem of sovereign debt. It's, uh, it's an issue, yeah, especially in the context of reform. Okay, thank you. So maybe now two minutes for everybody to comment last questions. David, Carly, maybe we'll start from you, then Michael and then Michael. Oh, oh. And I make all the announcements. <laughs> Yeah, so, sovereign debt uh, only, only matters if uh, you're not the sovereign. Um, the US can't uh, get bankrupt because it can just simply print money. And so the debt is no problem. You can just monetize the debt whenever you want. The problem is when uh, a country like Argentina borrows money in dollars and has to pay back the dollars and you know, all those kinds of things. So I think that. The, 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 that, that kind of debt is uh, you know, it's a, it's a problem for those countries that, that get caught in it. Um, what were the other kind of questions I was supposed to ask? Yeah, it was about co-ops also. What, oh, co-ops, yeah. Co I, mean, I mean, the co-op movement is, a, it, 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 it has historically been very significant, and I think it always will play a significant role. But the difficulty is if things around it don't change and the co-ops exist in a free market configuration, very often they end up, uh, you know, exp self-exploitation uh, in, in ways that really don't, don't keep them differentiated from what a capitalist firm would be like and what it would do. So I think, uh, you know, there is there is a situation right now, which is a general situation, uh, as I see it, that many, many institutions, many people in different situations are trying to create what you might call heterotopic spaces where they can do something different outside of the normal activity of a capitalist system. And those heterotopic spaces are terribly important. They're the beginning point of, of a potential revolution and transformation. Uh, but as Henri Lefebvre said about heterotopias, they are open only for a while. And within a short while, they are reabsorbed into the dominant praxis. And again and again, we've seen these movements reabsorbed into the dominant praxis which gets us to the question of reform versus revolution. Uh, Marx once kind of commented, the realm of freedom begins when the realm of necessity is left behind, and it's a fantastic kind of utopian passage, and then he can go to the very end, he says, so the beginning is short the length of the working day, which is a very reformist kind of demand. So I think maybe we should think of reforms uh, which capital obviously co-opts as creating, however, spaces where new things can happen. And, and I think on the working day, yeah, if it comes down from 10 to 8 hours, capital's okay with that. But if you brought it down to 3 hours, capital will be in real trouble. Uh, and, and so there are these revolutionary reforms which open doors that can be pushed a bit, 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 bit further. Capital is very widely, and there's no such thing as a good idea that capital can't figure out how to co-opt it. And, and so the good ideas on the left are constantly being co-opted. On the other hand, we recognize that and at the same time say, okay, hey, come along, co opt it, and then see what you get, because we're going to use that co optation to do something even further. So, if, so I think that we should really kind of get past this kind of revolutionary versus reform as a, as, a, as a simple dichotomy. They can feed into each other, or they can all capital and use it to stymie. I mean, okay, that's what class struggle is all about. Thank you, David. So, Mike. Thank you. Well, most of the questions didn't have to do with the end of uh, history, except for the one on uh, global warming and environment. And uh, tomorrow at 12.30, uh, David and I will be talking in the next room about that, uh, which requires a whole separate section uh, all of its own. Uh, uh, regarding my focus on debt and looking at history through the uh, focus of debt, debt has determined the mode of production again and again and again. Uh, the original mode of production in agricultural societies was agriculture. The means of transferring ownership from uh, self-sufficient production to absentee ownership in plantation crops was all done through debt. Uh, the only way that you could pry land away from the community uh, was by 
uh, debt, uh, not only in ancient society, but as Marx pointed out, in medieval Europe. Uh, it was the Templars uh, who made, and the Hospitallers who made the uh, loans that uh, enabled property to be taken out of the hands of uh, uh, British uh, communities and put into the hands of the uh, uh, other creditors. So debt really is, is the key. Similarly in Russia, uh, the way that property was concentrated has been very, uh, apart from uh, stealing it from the state, where most uh, capital comes from anyway, uh, the means of transferring it once it's already been taken once, uh, to get it taken over again is by debt and debt foreclosure. So to me, uh, that's the key dynamic and that's the essence uh, of uh, the, the fact that industrial capitalism is turning into finance capitalism, and that's the problem. Uh, industrial capitalism has not uh, become uh, as optimistic as Marx hoped. It's been uh, turned out much uh, more destructive than anything Marx had uh, anticipated or described. Thank you. Thank you, David. Well, David Harvey brought up the question of what about China? place that I visit once or twice a year. And uh, China is another part of the story of the neoliberal era. But China uh, does not have a neoliberal model. China went from uh, central planning and uh, state ownership to a uh, hybrid form of a statist economy, but a market economy with a capitalist sector. And it has been, of course, the most successful growth story in the neoliberal era and has provided, has fit in very well with the neoliberal form of capitalism that arose in other parts of the world, providing a whole new labor reserve, one that was well-educated that could work at low wages, uh, and providing growing demand uh, for the uh, neoliberal uh, form, which always had a demand problem. So that is part of the story, which I didn't discuss. Uh, reforms, in my view, there's no such thing as a non-co-optable some socialist communists have tried to come up with a reform that people could struggle around that could not possibly just pacify the working class. But anything, a shorter work day, uh, health care as a right, uh, these things can be one under certain conditions, and uh, they don't in themselves uh, make capitalism go away. But no one has ever found any other way to build a mass movement uh, for socialism. You can't do it just by talking about socialism. Some people uh, become socialists by reading a book, but there's not enough of them uh, to change society. Most people uh, become socialists through engaging in struggles around the particular forms of oppression and exploitation that they face, which are very varied, but in the capitalist era, they all can be traced back to capitalism. And through getting into motion around reforms, uh, the socialists can lead such struggles and build a growing socialist movement. And there's always the danger that it won't go farther than reforms, but that is the only way that you can build a mass movement for socialism that can win things for people, give them a sense of strength, and hopefully the conditions will emerge in which we can go the full way at some point. Thank you.